Hello and welcome to Farm Connections. I'm your host, Dan Hoffman. Today on Farm Connections, we sit down with Meg Moynihan from the Minnesota Department of Agriculture to discuss the need for open communication and the state of mental health in the agricultural community. Kent Tesey brings us his thoughts on custom farming being an alternative for farm operators, and Joanne Lauer tells us about the importance of saving up our egg money. All of that here today on Farm Connections. Welcome to Farm Connections with your host, Dan Hoffman. Farm Connections, sponsored by Alcorn Clean Fuel, a farmer-owned cooperative in Claremont, Minnesota, produces ethanol, high-protein livestock feed, and corn oil, and beverage-grade carbon dioxide for resale to benefit its members and their communities. Absolute Energy, a locally owned facility, produces 115 million gallons of ethanol annually. Proudly supporting local economies in Iowa and Minnesota. Absolute Energy, adding value to the neighborhood. The Agricultural Utilization Research Institute. Collaborating with businesses and entrepreneurs to foster long-term economic benefit for Minnesota through value-added agricultural products. You can learn more at auri.org. Con Tile Supply, Leroy, Minnesota and New Hampton, Iowa since 1985, supplying the market with field drain tile products, dual wall, metal culverts, septic systems, PVC and plumbing supplies. Welcome to Farm Connections. We have a very interesting guest today, Meg Moynihan from the Minnesota Department of Ag. Meg, welcome to Farm Connections. Well, thank you for having me, Dan. It's a pleasure to be here. The last time you were here, you talked about organic agriculture and your connections to that. Yep. Something's changed. What do you do now? Oh, a lot of things have changed. That was a whole lifetime ago. Um, for about 13 or 14 years, I was the organic lady for the state of Minnesota, and I worked with farmers all over the state, helping them understand organic requirements, organic practices, doing education outreach, um, reimbursement programs for cost mm -hmm. sharing, for certification. And uh, in the process of all that, I met, um, what's the order, met, fell in love with and married a dairy farmer who was an organic dairy farmer. And so all of a sudden, I was also an organic dairy farmer. So that was a new life for me. I'm, I'm a person who grew up uh, in Milwaukee, Wisconsin, of all places. Not a, not a urban, I'm not a rural person at all. It sounds like the perfect match and everything is looking really good. Well, it does, doesn't it? It seemed great. And so I was working for the state doing that job and working on the farm and learning how to operate equipment and milk cows and do all of that. And then um, one fateful day in March of 2016, we got a letter from our creamery and it said, um, you have 30 days, we're going to be stopping your route, so won't be picking up your milk anymore. Good luck. And that was it. And I thought to myself, I'm the organic lady, right? I know everybody. How hard can this be? I'll make a few phone calls. I knew that there had been a big, big demand for organic milk because I was promoting that the previous year. And uh, every door was closed. And we knocked and we knocked and we talked to other buyers and we talked to little cheese plants and we talked to, uh, we talked about running our own load down to a facility in Iowa, buying a milk truck. And none of that worked. And in the meantime, we dumped milk. You know what that's like. No dairy farmer, no farmer likes to no. do that. They're for producing two. for a lot of reasons. One, to feed the world, two, to feed their family. Absolutely. And um, three, to get up in the morning and to, you know, be responsible. And so we look in the tank at the end of the week and all of this huge thousand gallon tank full of beautiful milk was just going out the door. Um, so that was very difficult. And that was particularly difficult on my husband. And he finally said after two months, I've had it, that's it. I'm, I'm going to go back to an industry that values me. Pre, his previous life, he was an over-the-road truck driver moving household mm -hmm. furniture for a moving, moving company. So he felt very undervalued not having a market. Oh, he felt undervalued. He felt like a failure. He felt um, frustrated. He felt worried, financially worried. And uh, I was thinking, oh, everything will be fine. Everything will be fine. You know, if we just hang on, we'll find a place. We'll find a place. Mm -hmm. And so he announced that that was it. And he was going on the road, and he said, you know, do whatever you want with the cows, basically, or hire someone to do them, but I'm not doing this anymore. I'm guessing he was thinking, we have some fiscal responsibility, we have loans, we have bills to pay, we have family living costs, I'm going to go out and do the best I can and, and get an income. He did, and he, uh, he didn't grow up on that farm, he bought that farm in the early 80s, and then 
he bought the farm again, which I think a lot of farmers can relate to is, that, you know, you buy a farm and pretty soon the bank owns most of the farm and so then you have to buy the farm back from the bank again. So he had already done that once and he was not going to go down that road again. Mm -hmm. And that was, you know, that was it. And he, he felt, um, he felt just adrift, I think, and undervalued and that he couldn't make this work and it was very frustrating. And so in the meantime, I was busily, um, I was seeking some help for this crisis. So I was going to see Ted Matthews, whom I think you know, who of is um, with um, Minskew and works with farm families and difficulties all over the state. So I traveled to Mankato to see him. I had another therapist who had been very helpful to me for other reasons up in the Twin Cities. And so, so I was making the rounds trying to come to grips with, are we losing the farm? What does this mean about our marriage? What, you know, what's happening here? Are, are we going down with the ship? And, um, and to the, the um, you know, kind of the pride of like, I'm the organic lady and I can't make this work. I mean, that was a big, that was a big difficulty. So um, one day I had been to see Ted in the morning in Mankato and then I drove up to the Twin Cities to see Deborah, my therapist there. And then I was driving home and all of a sudden I thought to myself out of nowhere, well, why couldn't I be the farmer? And I went home and I talked to my husband, Kevin, and I said, so here's what I'm thinking. Is this a crazy idea? We graze most, mostly in the summertime. I mean, we're organic dairy farm. The cows are out most of the time. I said, I don't think I can handle the field work. You know, I can't raise corn and I can't harvest barley and I can't do all that stuff, but I can keep the cows fed and milked and call the vet when I need to and take care of calves and do that stuff as long as when you come home from your trips, you help me the way I help you after work. Mm -hmm. And that was fine with him. If I wanted to try that, that was okay. So off he went. And then one day I woke up and I was in charge of the whole freaking dairy. Ouch. 60, between 60 and 70 cows. And you have to remember, I'm, the, I'm a city person. I mean, I don't, know how to, I don't know how to use a TMR mixer. He showed me once. I can't back up equipment. Um, it, it, and we, uh, we're kind of um, uh, debt averse, so a lot of our equipment is older than I am, mm -hmm. you know, so it takes a little care and feeding to keep it running. There are tricks to getting the skid steer started. So it was quite amazing what I learned that I was capable of during that period of time. Now, I should, I should back up and tell you that I had gone to the Department of Agriculture and said, um, things are hitting the fan in my life, and uh, how would you feel about me taking a six-month leave of absence, because this is what's going on in my farm. And it's the Department of Agriculture, very understanding, and they were extremely supportive and said, we want you back as soon as possible, but go and do what you have to do. Wonderful. So, so there I was being a farmer for the summer. And as I had that experience, um, it was physically and emotionally very challenging for me. But as I was living that life, and interacting more with neighbors and friends, and, and friends, sometimes not friends in my neighborhood, but other farmers I knew that now sure. we had more in common, I began to really have an appreciation of how other people were struggling. Now, I listen to a lot of podcasts. You know what a podcast sure. is? Okay. I listen to a lot of podcasts while I'm doing all these chores, and there's one that I love. It's from the BBC, the British Broadcasting System. It's called Farming Today. It's 13 minutes a day, and they go all over England, Scotland, Wales, Northern Ireland, talking about agriculture and different themes. And they did a week on mental health, and they interviewed a young widow um, who was in her very early 30s, and her husband had committed suicide. She found him dead, and he had left a note and said, you couldn't help me, but maybe you can help other people. And almost the next day, she founded a charity um, to do mental health work in the rural communities. And she said, we're going to target people who work with farmers and teach them how to recognize when a farmer's in distress. So feed salespeople, veterinarians, mm -hmm. farm business management instructors, 4-H instructors, and have them be better able to help farmers. And I thought, man, that sounds like a good idea. I wonder if, I wonder if we do anything like that here. How did you reach out to those people when you found out there was many people that had some of the same stresses. Well, in addition to, you know, so I, I took that idea into the Department of Ag, that idea that had come from just that, you know, innocent listening to a podcast and being, being inspired by that and said, well, what if we did something like that here uh, and started talking to a few people, including Ted uh, and some other folks from the Sheriff's Association, from Farm Service Agency, and we decided that we wanted to do something like that. So we're in the middle of planning some workshops to do just that all over the state with agriculture advisors. 
And then those conversations also have led in other directions. Our commissioner's office is very um, tuned into this topic. And you know, Commissioner Fredrickson farmed for 24 years and he, in, the, in the 70s and the 80s, and he knows, he knows what it's like to struggle on a farm. Mm -hmm. And so he's been very supportive of this. Um, we have a farm and rural helpline that farmers can call, or any rural resident really can call 24 hours a day. It's free, it's confidential. So sometimes I think that when you're in difficulty, some of us are wired, we have someone that we always go to. We have a best friend, right. we have a counselor. Uh, and some people would quite frank, frankly find it more freeing to talk to somebody they've never met and they're never gonna talk to again. P part of that is rural and agriculture is very unique. Oh, yeah. There's a legacy piece, you know, this was great grandfather's farm. We've gotta keep it, we've gotta do this, we've gotta do that. There's expectations within the family, but then there's the neighborhood peer pressure. Oh. Well, yeah, so-and-so plants their rows of corn a lot straighter than you. So there's lots of issues there, plus the weather, plus the markets, plus sometimes politics surfaces. Absolutely. So there's a lot happening. It is a very complicated life, and I think sometimes um, people that, that don't walk in the agricultural world may look and say, oh, you know, all the ready cheek to peasants and they all have beautiful kitchens like this and they eat apple pie and you know they read books in the winter next to the wood stove and things like that it's like oh if you only knew that you know sometimes our community is very supportive and very wonderful and sometimes quite frankly there it's you know dog eat dog and there are feuds that have gone on for years and there are fights about fence lines or who snapped up a rental property that you wanted to rent I mean it's it's complicated well it seems like we could raise our awareness and understanding level and make things better. Absolutely, absolutely, and that's the goal. A, a tremendously valuable discussion, tremendously valuable comments and thoughts from you. What I really enjoy is hearing how you didn't choose to have issues. The issues came to you in the lifestyle and the business you were in. Mm -hmm. But what you did choose is how you responded. Thank you, Meg. Oh, it's been a delight. Thanks so much for having me. Our pleasure. Thanks for joining us on Farm Connections. Stay tuned for more. Due to the high cost of investment in farm machinery, an ever-increasing number of farm operators are hiring other farm operators to provide some or all of their machinery resources for their farming operation. Also, some landowners are choosing to operate a farm themselves rather than cash renting the land to another farm operator. In that case, the landowner is generally hiring a farm operator to provide the necessary tillage, planting, and harvesting crop operations under a custom farming agreement. In a typical custom farming arrangement, the custom operator agrees to perform all the machine operation on the owner's land in exchange for a set fee or rate per acre. The landowner pays for all seed, fertilizer, chemicals, crop insurance, and other input costs, receives all gr the grain produced, as well as all eligible farm program payments on the land, and is responsible to store and market the grain. The concept of a custom farming agreement is relatively simple. However, a written contract should definitely be prepared that specifies the farming practices to be performed, the amount of payment by the landowner to the custom operator and all other pertinent details. The normal field practices in the agreement typically include tillage, planting, weed control, harvesting and hauling the grain to storage and are usually part of the custom farming payment per acre. There needs to be an accurate count of the number of acres that will be under this agreement for payment and planning purposes. Additional field operations such as replanting due to weather conditions or added spraying applications of pesticides to control weeds and insects are usually an added charge per acre over and above the custom farming rate. Timing of planting and harvesting operations should be discussed and negotiated between the custom operator and the landowner prior to the growing season and be included in the written contract. This can become a tenuous issue, especially in years with challenging weather conditions. More details on custom farming agreements and current custom rates are available on the Iowa State University Ag Decision Maker website. Custom farming can provide a farm operator with some extra farm income with little or no additional farm machinery investment and only slight increases in fuel and repair costs. 
In this era of high land rental rates and very tight profit margins, farm operators can lower their risk through a custom agreement. Many landowners like custom agreements because they no longer have to negotiate land rental rates or collect lease payments. And they welcome the opportunity to make production and grain marketing decisions without the investment into a full line of farm machinery. Good communications between a landowner and the custom operator are essential to a good custom farming agreement. That's all for today and thank you for joining us. I would like to tell you a little story about egg money. You see, on the top of my refrigerator, I have a jar. And in that jar, I keep any extra money. My mom taught me that when we lived on our small farm four miles south of Thompson, Iowa. Because on her refrigerator, she kept a jar. And in that jar, she kept her egg money. Now, Mom usually had about 200 chickens until spring came, and of course, we would have eaten quite a few of them, and so she had to order baby chicks from the Murray McMurray Chicken Hatchery. They came in a cardboard box with little holes in the top. I guess one of the best things about being a farm kid is being able to lift those little fuzzy chicks out of the box dip their beak into water to teach them how to drink. And one day when they get to be huge chickens and start to lay eggs, well, mom had about 200 chickens, which meant, of course, 200 eggs every day to pick. Now, city girls call it gathering eggs. No, that's not how it works. You see, you go out to the chicken house, you pick up a board or a stick or something, not to hurt the hen, you understand, just to hold her head so she can peck you because it hurts. So with the other hand, you pick the egg out of the nest. It's called picking eggs. And then mom and I would carry the baskets of eggs down to the basement to wash each egg and put it into its own little square there in the cardboard divider. The egg man came twice a week. I think that was his name. He paid mom top dollar, 18 cents a dozen for those eggs. Those eggs were the only cash money we had in the house. It was the most, most important money we had. Now, we moved on to that farm when I was about eight years old. No one had lived on the place for I don't know, three years, four years, just rats. Dad came into the house one evening announcing that he had seen a rat in the barn, two in the chicken house. And it was Dad's very firm belief that if you see even one rat, there are 500 out there somewhere. Next morning, he went into Thompson and bought every bag of rat poison he could find. That night and every night for a week, he filled the feeders full of rat poison as the chickens went to roost. After that week, no more rats. Not a chicken was harmed. My dad's pretty smart. That egg money had to be protected at any price, you see, because it bought groceries, it bought school clothes, it bought school lunch tickets, it bought Sunday school shoes, it bought everything. And one day, it bought something else. When mom and I came out of the dime store in Forest City, we normally just got back into the car and drove home, but this day, we went to Reuben's department store across the street. The man saw mom and I come in. Well, I should say he noticed my mother, who's beautiful. He didn't notice me for sure. And he said, Mrs. Ostrander, there is a dress in the window you should try. 
She said, oh no, I couldn't afford anything in your store. And he said, well, but it's blue to match your Norwegian blue eyes. She tried it on, and when it fit her so perfectly, he brought out a little pillbox hat with a veil and jewelry. She looked like a queen. I guess he thought so too, because he invited her to be in the style show next week. That style show gave her so much confidence. There she was, the Iowa farm girl, in this whole lineup of doctor's wives and lawyer's wives. She felt so good. Of course, nobody knew, but at the end of that day, she bought that dress with her egg money. Now, I was never allowed to ask for anything out of the egg money or to ask how she would spend it. But one day, as mom and I were sitting in the basement washing each egg and putting it into the dividers, I had the Sears Roebuck catalog behind me with, with the page earmarked. Mom, I said, took all the courage I had. Mom, Mom, there's something I would really like in the catalog. You know, on, on the Ed Sullivan show, I saw someone play a violin. Oh, Mom, it was more beautiful than you can imagine. Do you think you could buy me a violin, Mom? And it costs a lot of money. It costs $14.99, and, and I know that's a lot, but do you think, do you think we could get it with your egg money? Nonsense, she said wash eggs. About a week or so later, I came home from school, and there, sitting in the living room, was an old upright piano with lessons in Thompson for a dollar an hour. Joanne, she said, I'm not going to buy you a violin. I know that a violin is a really beautiful instrument, but you already have something you need to use. You need to use your voice, because you see, your voice is an instrument too. I am so rich, so rich. Oh, no, I don't have a lot of money, but I have wonderful parents, children, friends, and of course, on the top of my refrigerator, I have a jar. And in that jar, I keep my own egg money. Turkey flocks are a common sight across Minnesota as the state leads the nation in turkey production. But this flock is destined for a bigger stage. These birds are being raised by National Turkey Federation Chair Carl Wittenberg of Douglas County, Minnesota. From this brood of 80 birds, two will be selected to go to Washington, D.C. for Thanksgiving as the 2017 presidential turkeys. So we started 80 turkeys in the presidential flock, and we have half male, and half female. So what we do is over time, we'll select a turkey that is either a male or a female, and it's really about appearance and stance and, and posture. Uh, typically, it's, it's a male because males strut and they show their feathers, but we're gonna look at both the male and the female, but we'll get down to two turkeys at the end. Getting the birds ready for their moments of fame is a lengthy process. Wittenberg is getting help from five Douglas County 4-H'ers who applied and interviewed for the chance to work with the presidential birds. At first I was like a little cautious around birds because I don't have a lot of experience with birds, but we kind of worked out this understanding like I won't bother you, you won't bother me, and then once we got past that, it was kind of like learning their personalities. Uh, we're just going to be taking care of them and just coming to kind of play with them, I guess, and hang out with them and just get them used to people and, I don't know, just kind of check out what their personalities are and their characteristics. 
Having turkeys appear at the White House before Thanksgiving is not only an honor for the growers, it's an opportunity to raise the profile of the turkey industry. From a Minnesota turkey standpoint, it gives us an opportunity to highlight those farmers and the product that they raise. Uh, Minnesota ranks number one in turkey production. We uh, will produce about 46 million birds each year. We've all seen news clips of the presidential pardon of the official turkey. However, I've never realized, I don't think most of us, how much work goes into number one, raising that turkey, and number two, getting it ready for a trip to Washington. Well, we're finding out there's a lot more that goes on behind the scenes. This is Lynn Kettleson reporting. Open communication and compassion are necessary parts of any community. As the world around us continues to change and grow, it's important that we remember to look out for one another and stay connected. I'm Dan Hoffman. Thank you for joining us on Farm Connections. Funding for this program is provided in part by the Minnesota Arts and Cultural Heritage Fund and the citizens of Minnesota. <laughs>